What is up, Watch Fam? Happy Thursday, and welcome to this week's episode of Off Topic. I am Christian from Theo and Harris, and today we're going to be diving into the Gucci Horsebit Loafer. Its history, quality, value, and most of all, its mysterious allure. Let's do it. In the early 20th century, a young Italian named Guccio Gucci, yeah, that was his name, worked as a bellhop in London Savoy Hotel. Absolutely surrounded by the luggage of the elite, Guccio found himself taken with the soft, richly tanned bags and their owners. So when he returned to Italy, he began to follow that interest, that developing passion. Guccio began to build a saddlery shop right outside of Florence, specializing in finely crafted accessories for the well-to-do, most of whom were equestrians. So from day one, horse culture, riding, training, polo was within the Gucci image. So when Guccio's eldest son Aldo took the reins of the company in 1953 and incorporated the horse bit into a loafer, it wasn't exploitation of a wealthy hobby. It was the exploration of his company's DNA. It wasn't throwing a Maserati logo on a chronograph and selling it to Ghibli owners. It was a nod to his father's roots. The loafer quickly took off. The semi-casual and yet still formal aesthetic allowed them to be gobbled up by the Italians and the English. And then, a bit later, the Americans. And we really took to them. In 1969, 84,000 pairs of Gucci's horsebit loafer were being sold in the United States. Okay, we get it. The history of the horsebit loafer is incredibly rich. And as such, they sell like hotcakes. But are the shoes themselves any good? In short, yes. The uppers are calf, which has a nice buttery hand. But even after significant wear, they prove their resistance. The coloring of this light brown pair is rich too. They have a slight burnish on the toe, which creates some awesome depth. And the lining is really interesting. It seems to be a cotton linen blend as opposed to calf, making them more breathable and not sticky on warm days. You gotta give Gucci credit for that. Their construction process, although not without the intervention of machine, is pretty damn hands-on. Their workshop, apparently a small, discreet building outside of Florence, is where the craftsmen hand-cut, sew, and color each pair. Their sole and their calved uppers are Blake-stitched, which gives them a softer, more comfortable, almost slipper-like wearing experience, unlike a Goodyear welt from Alden, let's say. The Blake stitch also allows the upper to rest closer to the sole, which is an irreplaceable asset of their design. Gucci's choice to use the Blake stitch in construction presents a little bit of a conundrum, though, because it's a less expensive process than Goodyear, let's say, and because it's being used on a premium shoe, it raises questions about Gucci's intention, whether they're cutting corners right in front of our eyes and we're just smiling and saying thank you. I personally completely disagree. I think the Blake stitch was chosen because, really, it's the only method that would have allowed the Gucci loafer to be the Gucci loafer, really the only method of construction that would have allowed the loafer to achieve that super sleek, effortless, almost invisible sole aesthetic. When I first got into this obsession about six years ago, they were priced at $550 a pair. Now resting at, and probably rising from shortly, $690 value definitely becomes a question. Are there better shoes for the money? Sure. Carmina's Cordovan Loafer at $750 is crafted from Horween Shell Cordovan by a company with, although less recognition, a longer presence and dedication to the craft of shoemaking. All for $60 more. And if you want to compare apples to apples, Carmina's calf option of the same loafer undercuts Gucci by $210. So yes, without a doubt, there are technically better shoes for the dollar, but Gucci is still delivering quality, along with some remarkable history and quite possibly one of the best designed shoes ever. And that's very important to note. The Gucci loafer is without a doubt one of the most coveted shoes in the world. 
In fact, it's probably one of the world's most desired luxury items, right up there with the Rolex Date-Date. Everyone seems to remember and still enjoy their first pair, and in an abstract way, feel connected to the legends that wore them as well. Gianni Agnelli, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and Francis Ford Coppola, just to name a few. It's become emblematic of a lifestyle, one we love to catch even a glimpse of. It's this luxurious, effortless world, the kind of place where nothing really ever goes wrong and the cold wine never runs dry. They're ingrained in our culture, totally revered. It's the only shoe in the permanent collection of New York's Museum of Modern Art, a position it's held since 1985. And why? It's their unwavering dedication to their core principles of design, the Gucci image. Much like Cartier and their formula, you know, the slim, precious case and crisp Roman dial, Gucci is unapologetically themselves. As a result, they are the only manufacturer that can release a calf loafer with their subtle, semi-dress, semi-casual silhouette and honestly say they pioneered it. And certainly the only ones that can even utter the words horse bit, everyone else is a copycat. And like Cartier, they've managed to reimagine these principles dozens of times, reinventing the way they're expressed. But of course, never really compromising them. Cartier has the Tank American a longer, sleeker Louis. Gucci has the Jordan. They have conviction in their design and infectious love for their DNA. The Gucci loafer is no longer hype. It's legend.